What's up y'all, Shuffle, and today we will be talking about Grave Robber and opening with her in battles. So the discussion usually comes down to, do we start with rank 4 and lunge, or do we start with Shadow Fade? Especially because I really like playing Grave Robber in general, I'm a big advocate of Shadow Fade. And I've had a lot of people say that it's not that good, and I've had a lot of people say that it's better to open with rank 4, lunge, and not Shadow Fade or they say infinite lunge teams are just better. So we're gonna go over the numbers and the experiment, I guess for lack of a better word, that I ran, and we will break everything down and analyze it. As always, before we get started, make sure you like, comment, subscribe, all that stupid stuff, follow me on Twitch, join Discord, thank you so much, and now let us talk about the conditions and the structure of this video. The conditions of Grey Robber for this video is we are going to run her with the Raider Salesman and the Sharpened Letter Opener. I feel that these two give her the most consistency in her overall kit for everything she wants to do, and she also gets some utility to the party by having bonus scouting chance. So I think that this is a realistic setup that you will be running with Grave Robber. Obviously you can run other stuff to get her different things like more flat damage or more crits, stuff like that. Those are options that you have, but I think this set is the most consistent and most usable to like all parties of Grave Robber. We have Districts Active as well, so we have Cartographer's Camp, and then we also have the House of the Yellow Hand, which provides, I think, a total of like 5% extra crit because of the Torchlight benefit and the benefit of the Yellow Hand. The final piece of this equation that we will be running is that we will have ideal and realistic comps for each setup. So obviously you can run some funky stuff and probably get just higher damage numbers in general, but I'm trying to pick things that I've seen people run for Grave Robber teams and then also things that I ran myself. So I want to make sure that I give the most fair and accurate representation of each side of this argument that I can. To start off with, when we run Grave Robber in a not Shadow Fade type of setup, so this could be either a double lunge or an infinite lunge setup. So a double lunge is you put her in four, you lunge up to two, someone in three that's much slower than her, like Crusader, uses Holy Lance or Duelist Advance or whatever else you're using, and then they move past Grave Robber, pushing her back into three, and then she lunges again on turn two. There's another version of this called Infinite Lunge, where you can put Grave Robber in three, and then again have someone like Crusader because he's very slow in rank two, and then have someone like Shieldbreaker or Highwayman in rank one, so that Grave Robber lunges past them up to rank one, and then rank two, does their dance move, and then rank 3 does their dance move, and they move all the way up the chain, and Grave Robber ends up back in rank 3 at the start of the next turn. This is what gives you infinite lunge. These numbers were taken from in-game while I was doing my testing. So in the double lunge slash infinite lunge setup, Grave Robber's damage without Shadow Fade is 13 to 25, and the crit gets up to 37. That's pretty respectable. In the Shadow Fade and lunge setup, Grave Robber's Base damage before critting is 23 to 45. That seems pretty high. And then the crit goes up to 66. The math I did, it should be 67 or 68, but when I did it in game, I was getting 66. So I'm not sure where the extra damage gets lost, but it is relevant. So I'm gonna trust the in-game numbers over my own math. I should also clarify, when I say the crit, I mean the crit damage, not the crit chance. The crit chance is about 3940, but the crit damage is what goes up to 66. The final weird piece of this puzzle is the blight damage for Lunge. It goes up to 33% extra damage at champion, or I should say level 5. But for some reason, it doesn't come out to the same that you'd expect. So if you Shadow Fade, and then you have Blight stacked on the target, and you're going to lunge, your damage goes from 45 to 51 on the maximum, which isn't 33%. So when I played around with the numbers, it seems like the Blight damage is actually calculated against Grave Robber's base damage, not like lunge and Shadow Fade together, which is really weird. So that means that Blight actually doesn't get as much bonus damage as you would think, especially in a Fade setup, which means that Blight damage actually gets a little bit better for non-Fade setups because of the ability to lunge multiple times in succession, and then also the Shadow Fade not scaling the Blight damage as high as you would think. Okay, so in this vacuum, now we have a bunch of numbers, we have some math, we have damage range. What does all of this mean? So if you want to run a double lunge or infinite lunge setup, your average damage comes out to 24.76 if you include critical hits. The math I used was I took the non-crit damage average times the non-crit chance percentage, so uh, plus 
the crit damage, like the maximum crit damage, since that's always just a static number, times the crit chance, and then I added those together. This is a way to do it that I found not just in Discord, I asked for like how to do this. Like I had an idea of how to do this, but I asked people how to do this also, and then I looked also on Reddits, so LOL Reddit, but I looked there also to see if this is how they would crunch that number, and this is the formula that came up like every time I was looking for it. So I'm hoping this is correct, and it does seem correct from how the testing has come out and what I've been looking at. So this is what I'm running with. Now that the math is out of the way there, the lunge with fade setup comes out to 23.2 damage a turn because you have to spend two turns to set this up. So just by that, you're looking at 23.2 damage versus 24.76 average damage. So even though Shadow Fade gets double damage for fading plus bonus crit, it actually comes out to 1 to 2 points less of damage on average. That's pretty strange, but I guess it does make sense. And this is relevant in some cases, but overall, you probably won't notice the 1 to 2 damage difference. But it does matter, and we'll talk about those cases why it does. Just from the raw numbers in the vacuum, it does seem like spam lunging is just better on average. However, when we do think about spam lunging, double lunge, infinite lunge, all that, we have to consider the teams that we're using, because if we are doing an infinite lunge combo, that means we are dedicating three people to dancing every single turn. And that means that you're trading away valuable things like stuns, or stalling mechanics, or heals. You can still run a healer, but then like, you're taking more damage than normal because you have three people just doing damage the entire time, instead of running something with more control elements like Abomination or Plague Doctor, who are very common in Grave Robber teams. The benefits in the lunge spam favor is that the teams that do this are more equipped for hallway fights because they have higher damage per turn, and they're more flexible in how they do damage. So if you get an opening crit with Grave Robber and you just drop the rank 3 Cultist Switch, that means that your other two characters that are dancing with her can pick other targets, and that's pretty cool. If you run the Shadow Fade and Lunge combo, it does better against big bodies and bosses and stuff like that, but it is much lower tempo. So from just the numbers, you're probably thinking, okay, I just double lunge or infinite lunge, right? That's just the most damage, especially infinite lunge because you don't have to take an extra turn to set up the shadow fade. You can just keep spamming lunge. It's pretty good. However, that's not the end all be all of it. And shadow fade does have other differences. So if you're just looking for raw damage output, you open with lunge and then you spam lunge for the entire battle. That is just gonna get you more damage on average. The other part of it too is infinite lunge doesn't seem as amazing as a team for a few reasons. You give up things that I said before, so you give up stuns, it's a little harder to team build in that situation. It's pretty easy to find one dance partner for Grave Robber, kind of hard to find two, and then you have to set up the two so they all go in the set order of one, two, three, and it's kind of hard to get that mid person to be slower than Grave Robber. Well, like, you can get them to be slower, but to consistently roll under her, is actually not that easy. So I tried one setup where I ran Highwayman, and I forgot that Highwayman's crit buff is more speed. So if I open with Duelist Advance and he got one crit, he was like one point behind Grave Robber, and that made getting lunge every turn actually really hard. So I would actually not recommend it. The other one is Shield Breaker, and there's a lot of utility in Shield Breaker, so I'd probably go that way. For the second partner, I would not run Highwayman or second Shield Breaker just because it's really hard to get the speeds to where you want them to at that point. So you're kind of stuck with either someone like Man at Arms to Rampart Spam, which actually gives you some stun utility, so that's something there that I didn't think about until I literally said it just now. Or you run Crusader because Crusader can hit rank 4, Crusader is very slow, you can make them super slow with the Spalders or Legendary Bracer and stuff like that, so that's the most consistent way to get Infinite Lunge. I think with that in mind, if you wanted to run the Infinite Lunge combo, I think the team I would use would be Grave Robber, obviously, Vessel for consistent healing, and then it would be Man at Arms and probably Shield Breaker. The reason is Shield Breaker can pull rank 4 or pierce it, because Lunge doesn't hit rank 4, which makes it kind of not as good as you would think. Like, it's really good in the base, or the burst damage, obviously, but not being able to hit rank 4 with it makes it kind of a pain in the butt, and rank 4 is probably the most dangerous position on the enemy team, so you need some way to hit rank 4, and that's either with Holy Lance, or Pierce, or Puncture them up to rank 2, and then Lunge them the next turn. Man-at-Arms gives you that ability to stun, 
that I think an infinite lunge team desperately needs, as well as Vessel, she can stun too. So I think having that core, you can probably get some consistent turn denial on each turn, as well as a lot of burst damage, and you don't really need the Blight. Otherwise, if you're not running a team like that, I don't like the infinite lunge combo. Just because, like I said, you trade off too many things, your team gets pretty beat up doing it. In my testing, you know, since I wasn't denying turns, especially if I didn't run Vessel, if I tried to run someone like Arbalest, then I was just getting hit by the enemy, like, the entire fight, and it was not cool. So I don't advocate for infinite lunge unless you run Man-at-Arms. Then it's actually probably at its best. Double lunge, I could go over a bunch of teams, but really you just need one person slower than Grave Robber that sits in rank 2. So when she lunges past them, they just dance afterwards, and then you get a second lunge. I actually like double lunge more as a team than infinite lunge, because you have more flexibility in how you build it, and most fights only go to round 4. So that's why it's really important to think of the teams like this, where you have double lunge and then fade lunge, that's 4 turns. You have double lunge and then what's Grave Robber doing for the other two turns, if it's not fade lunge, then you're probably looking at maybe a throw dagger or pick to the face or poison darts. Or maybe you shadow fade anyway just to stall, those are options. And then if you run the fade and lunge setup, you have a very consistent 4 turn strategy that will always kill like two things. Like having fade lunge is very consistent at downing enemies, and I'll talk about fade lunge a little more here in a sec. But that also goes over four turns. So same idea applies. You do fade lunge, fade lunge, four turns are gone. Usually three enemies are dead, probably all four. And then you have a chance to stall. And fade lunge also gives you more control of the fight because you can let Grave Robber just do her thing the entire time. You don't need dance partners at that point. So that means the Grave Robber can just fade and lunge and do damage every time. And then you have a set of three characters that are more independent and they function cohesively together and then you can find a lot more chances to run stuns or heals or other ways to stall stress heals stuff like that okay we keep coming back to this point so obviously double lunge gets you the most consistent damage output that makes it the best right not necessarily so there are times to use fade lunge obviously the team building aspect is a important part of this decision. The next is to consider what your setting is, like what you're going up against and what difficulty you're playing in. If you are playing in Darkest or Radiant, Double Lunge is actually way better just because the enemies have such lower amounts of HP. They have 20% less HP on Darkest than they do on Blood Moon or Stygian. So that means the Double Lunge is consistently killing things and that makes it a lot better. In Blood Moon, if we look at the damage numbers that I have, if you don't run Fade, the top end of your lunge damage without Blight is 25. That does not kill Cultus Switch in rank 3, and I think she's probably the best baseline enemy to consider. However, Shadow Fade and Lunge does kill her consistently. Obviously, you can low roll a little bit, and then you're kind of in trouble. But if you're not low rolling, and when I say low rolling, I mean the odds are pretty much in your favor. You have a 40% crit chance. And the chance to low roll and not kill Cultus Witch is about 30% from a Shadow Fade and Lunge combo. But also Grave Robber is fast enough that she is consistently going to go before Cultus Witch on turn 2. So Cultus Witch in both scenarios usually only gets one attack unless you're running some kind of stun. So the reason to run Shadow Fade and Lunge as the setup would be if you want to consistently down whatever is in rank 3 or potentially like a rank 2 threat. And also if you're playing in a higher difficulty like Stygian or Blood Moon. Because if you do Shadow Fade and Lunge and Darkest or Radiant, you're going to be overkilling by quite a bit. And I don't usually care about wasting damage in Darkest Dungeon because taking turns off the board is the most important thing. But overkilling by that much is probably not warranted, especially when you can consistently kill stuff just by going a double lunge strat. And oftentimes the single lunge might do it. So it's a done deal, right? That's it, Shuffle. Double Lunge does more damage. Shadow Fade gets you some consistent results if you're playing in higher difficulties. So I should just probably still run Double Lunge, right? Again, I'm going to say not necessarily. So the reasons also to run Shadow Fade, it's not just the pure damage aspect of it. I think this is something people often forget. They go, Grave Robber does damage. I need her to do as much damage as possible. Double Lunge is always damage, so therefore it's better. And that's where I'm going to disagree. 
because with Shadow Fade, you also get the dodge bonus, which lasts for more than the singular turn that the stealth and damage bonus gets. You also get the ability to go stealth, which is nice, and that means the Grave Robber can't be targeted, and she's very squishy. So on those turns when you do Shadow Fade, you're safe, and then when you lunge, you have dodge on the following turns, so if something does swing at her, she's still looking like she might be okay, because your dodge is around, I think, 45 at that point. And that's not bad. That's a good 35-40% to 40 chance to dodge most things at Champion. The other thing to consider in terms of the damage department as well, is that even though Shadow Fade and Lunge is one just big hit, when it crits, it crits pretty hard. And even though it's not quite double damage in terms of the crit damage, if you wanted to get the same damage out of a crit for double lunge, you're not guaranteed to. So you get like the one crit for 37, and then your second hit is probably, you know, statistically not going to crit just because you have only about 31, 32% chance to crit at that point. So while you have the ability to get consistent damage out of double lunge, your burst damage potential for Shadow Fade and Lunge is much higher because your crit rate's about 40%, and then also your crits are just overall stronger because you're not going to crit twice in a row with lunge that often. You can, but it's not going to be often. So if you're fighting something like a rank 2, or not, not a rank 2, but a size 2 or bigger enemy, where they usually have a ton of HP, so like the big bandit at champion in Blood Moon, I think it has 82. So you need to be able to take that down pretty quickly, and Shadow Fade and Lunge consistently get you closer to being able to do that than Double Lunge would. However, again, the trade-offs. So Shadow Fade and Lunge, if you don't crit and you do hit that low roll on the you know bottom half of the damage, because your damage range is so wide, then it's actually pretty bad, and it's consistently a damage loss, because if you hit 23 or 25 or something like that twice in a row, that's really bad in terms of damage, whereas Double Lunge would probably be putting up higher numbers. And then finally, the other advantage to having Shadow Fade and Lunge and doing that setup is the fact that if you are fighting an enemy that moves around a lot while you're fighting it, you may not be able to lunge it every turn. So if you're fighting, I'm not going to name bosses and spoil people, but there are some bosses that move while you fight them, and sometimes they go to rank 4 and you can't reach them. So if you're in that situation, you want to be able to plan out your one big hit and then get your one big hit because you may not be able to get double lunge depending on how the fight's going, maybe the boss stuns, they move, stuff like that. So, if you plan it right, you just get huge burst damage. The other advantage is since you have that higher crit chance and that higher burst damage potential, you can actually end the fight a little bit faster, more consistently, and against bosses, size 2 enemies, mini bosses and stuff like that, when you crit for 76 or 66 or whatever, depending on if you have blight or not, with shadow fade and lunge, you're ending the fight faster, and you're not overkilling by a ton in most cases, unless they're already at like 10 HP or something like that. So that means that Shadow Fade and Lunge as a combo are usually better against big enemies with high health pools, or mini bosses and bosses. Whereas a double lunge combo is much better in your standard hallway or room battle. The other point I will give to the double lunge combo is that if you decide, well I shouldn't say decide, but if you happen to high roll and you just get that gnarly 37 damage crit in your opener and you take down Cult of Switch, you're feeling good. That means the rest of your team is flexible. They can do whatever they want and Grave Robber doesn't necessarily have to lunge a second time next turn or she can pick a different target because you got rid of your primary target. And the rest of the team is more flexible and you have options and you can stall or you can heal and do all that kind of awesome stuff. But then again, you can kind of do that with Shadow Fade and Lunge already because the other three heroes in that team are independent of Grave Robber. They just have to be able to operate when she goes from position 1 to position 2. I also think I forgot to talk about the quote ideal team for a Shadow Fade and Lunge combo. The one I was considering was the standard Grave Robber team that I run when I want to do Shadow Fade and Lunge, which is Hellion, Abomination, Vestal, and then Grave Robber, because you get Blight Synergy if you need to, you have stuns on three other characters, which helps protect the team as well as Grave Robber, and then you have ways to reach rank 4 as well. So you have Throw Dagger, you can Shadow Fade into Throw Dagger, and then you have Iron Swan, and you have Judgment. So you have a few different ways to hit rank uh, 4, I was going to say 3. And then you have stuns all over the place, and if you run Broken Key and Padlock of Transference, you have double stun potential on Abomination. When you run a team like the one I just mentioned, you also have the flexibility of when Grave Robber Shadow Fades, you can decide to either use Manacles on someone, to get your third stun out there, or second stun, however many stuns you're dropping that turn. Or you can use Beast Bile and set up that Blight 
to help you kill like super big rank 2, not rank, I keep saying rank 2, size 2 enemies or mini bosses. Even though you get a little bit less damage by fading and using blight synergy when you lunge, compared to just double lunge or blight with double lunge and stuff like that, it's still helpful, it's still an extra 5 damage, and I'm not talking about the damage over time, I'm talking about the damage that Grave Robber gets from it, and that's good enough. Actually, I think it's an extra 6, because the top end goes from 45 to 51, but it's 5 or 6 regardless. Okay, I apologize, that was a lot of info, a lot of numbers at one time. So, just to recap, uh, damage is not the end-all be-all, so you have to decide what you're training in your team when you go for double lunge, infinite lunge, or fade lunge. Those are your choices, so what are you trading by enabling each of those strategies? Double Lunge gets the highest damage output over 4 turns. Regardless of which setup you decide to use for your team, if you are playing it correctly and you have the good trinkets and all that, Cultist Witch is still dead at the start of turn 2. But sometimes, depending on the enemy roll, the Cultist Witch is getting one turn off anyway, no matter what you do. If you run the Shadow Fade and Lunge setup, Grave Robber takes much less damage on average, not just from being able to stealth, but also from the dodge bonus that she gets. As far as the teams and stuff go, Grave Robber should have both moves enabled anyway. It doesn't matter if you don't plan to Shadow Fade, she should have it anyway just in case you run into that occasional mini boss, or if you're going on a boss mission, or in case your team gets surprised at full torch. That's another benefit of Shadow Fade that you can't translate to raw damage. It's not just the defensive abilities, but also the ability to rearrange your team and put people back into positions they should be in. The final point in the recap is that Infinite Lunge looks good in a vacuum, but you lose too much in your team in terms of trade-offs to make it, I think, worthwhile in most cases, unless you run, I guess, Man-at-Arms just because you get the chance to stun, and then you have to run someone that can hit rank 4. Alright y'all, that's going to do it for this one. I'm sorry if I missed something. I may have. This video, in terms of the script, came out to about two pages, and there's just math for about half a page going down, so it was fun to do. It was fun to think about, and I guess I can't give you a clear answer, unless you want to think about it like double lunge, unless you're going to fight a boss, then shadow fade lunge. That's probably the clear-cut answer I can give you. Otherwise, let me know what you're thinking, let me know if I missed something, or if there's something that you considered, obviously, that I missed, because there's, you know, 17 characters, not counting Musketeer, that we have to consider. So I'm sure there's all manner of fun stuff out there. And in terms of videos coming up, I'm still working on the new player guide that I want to do. I'm going to start working on the Antiquarian guide, finally. I just haven't. Like, I have notes, but I haven't sat down and recorded anything. And then, obviously, follow me on Twitch, uh, join Discord, we have almost 500 people. Very cool, very awesome. And I think that's it. So I will see you all later.